Muy buenos días, amados. Good morning, hermanos beloved brethren and friends present here in Santiago, de Chile. Santiago Chile. It is a great privilege to be with you on this occasion to share some moments of spiritual fellowship around the Word of God under the subject, the mystery of the seven seals of Revelation chapter 5. And let's read in chapter 5 of Revelation, verse 1 to 7, where he tells us the following. And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to lose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven nor in earth neither under the earth was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders said unto me, Weep not, Behold, the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to lose the seven seals thereof. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb, as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of saints. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for Thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by Thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. May God bless our souls with his word and allow us to understand it on this occasion. You may be seated if you're so kind. The mystery of the seven seals of this book of Revelation, chapter 5, verse 1 to 10. The mystery of the seven seals. In order to understand the mystery of these seven seals, we need to understand what book this is that is so important that no one in heaven or earth, neither under the earth, was worthy to open this book, not even to read it, not even to look at this book. This book is so important that John says that because no one was found worthy to open this book, it had to be a human being. It couldn't be the angels, but a human being. 
And this book was so important, but no one was found worthy that that is the reason John wept so much. Because if that book was not open, all of creation would be lost. Even with Christ dying on Calvary's cross and shedding his blood, even so, if this book was not open in heaven, everything would go to how it was before creation. Because once Christ carried out his work of redemption on Calvary's cross, he has to make the claim for everything he redeemed. He has to do it in heaven. And this book is the title deed of the heavens and the earth. Just like in a court, a title deed is presented and the claim is made over everything contained in that title deed so that the person who has his name there as an heir can obtain that inheritance. And now, that is, when an inheritance is in dispute. And God's inheritance for the children of God has been in dispute since the human being fell in the Garden of Eden. The devil stole the human being's inheritance, this earth and everything it contains, and the human being lost the rights to eternal life. He fell from eternal life. He lost the rights that he had before the fall. The human being could speak the word and what he spoke would materialize. And now, with the fall of the human being, the title deed goes back to its original owner, to God. Because even though the devil deceived the human being in the Garden of Eden and stole the property, the inheritance that God had given the human being, the title deed went back to God. The devil wasn't able to take that title deed. And now notice how the human being entered death after the fall. And the human being is born here on earth, lives for a period of time, and then dies. The human being has obtained that as a result of the fall there in the Garden of Eden. When the human being is born, he receives a mortal, corruptible, and temporary body in the spirit of the world of the fifth dimension enters into that body. And it is a spirit in God's permissive will. It is a spirit of the world that inclines a human being to evil. And the human being lives in bondage here on earth for a certain period of time, but he can't take anything from here, from earth, when his days here on earth come to an end. And Many don't even know where they're going when their days here on earth come to an end. And they don't understand that there are other dimensions. There are how many dimensions? There are seven dimensions. We have the dimension of light, the dimension of time, the dimension of matter, the fourth dimension, which is the dimension of waves, the fifth dimension, which is hell. We have the sixth dimension, which is paradise. And we have the seventh Dimension, which is the dimension of God, where God dwells, the seventh dimension. That is the dimension where God is. But notice, God moves into other dimensions. 
llamado el verbo de Dios. We find him in the sixth dimension with a theophanic body called the Word of God in which he appeared to the prophet and patriarch Abraham. On one occasion he appeared to him as Melchizedek and on another occasion he appeared to him as Elohim. Notice Melchizedek without father, without mother, without beginning of days, nor end of time. And who is that? Well, that is God. There is no one else like that. But he appeared in a body and he gave bread and wine to Abraham. And Abraham paid Melchizedek tithes of all. The scripture says that when Abraham tithed to Melchizedek, Levi was tithing. And how can this be possible? For Levi hadn't been born yet. Even Levi's father hadn't been born yet which was whom? Jacob. Even Jacob hadn't been born yet. Even Isaac hadn't been born yet, which is Jacob's father. Now, notice, before Isaac, Jacob, or Levi were even born, Levi was already tithing to Melchizedek. Why? Because Levi was in Abraham's loins, and so was Jacob, and so was Isaac. And now we can see how Levi was represented in Abraham, and Jacob was also represented there, and Isaac was represented there, and all the children of Abraham are represented in Abraham, both the children of Abraham by flesh, which is the earthly Israel, as well as the children of Abraham by faith through the Son of Abraham, Jesus Christ, which is the heavenly Israel. We were all represented there when Abraham met Melchizedek and paid his tithes to him. And that is why the children of Abraham, both of the Hebrew people and of the heavenly Israel, tithe to God, to Melchizedek. And now we can see that on another occasion, he appeared to him as Elohim, and he ate with Abraham. That was the day before the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, a type and figure of the coming of Christ at the last day before the destruction of this world, the destruction of the Gentile kingdom. Before the destruction of the Gentile kingdom, Elohim will be manifested here on earth in a visible form to Abraham's seed, to Abraham's heavenly seed, and Abraham's earthly seed too. In other words, to the heavenly Israel first, and then to the earthly Israel. Elohim will also appear to the earthly Israel, who is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And now at the end time, not only will he be in his theophanic body, but in a body of flesh. He will be manifested in the body of flesh at the last day in the angel of the Lord Jesus Christ who appears in Revelation chapter 22, verse 6, and Revelation 22, verse 16, of whom Christ says, I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show unto his servants the things which must shortly be done, the things which must happen. And in Revelation chapter 4, verse 1, Christ told us, Come up hither, and I will show thee things 
which must be hereafter. And notice how Christ, through his angel messenger, makes known to us these things which must surely be done, because Jesus Christ in Holy Spirit, which is the angel of the covenant, the angel of the Lord, will be manifested in human flesh in his angel messenger at the last day, before the destruction of the world, before the destruction of the gentle kingdom, just as it happened before the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. And just as we find that God appeared to Moses in the pillar of fire and then veiled himself in Moses and delivered the Hebrew people through Moses. God, Elohim, was among the Hebrew people there in Egypt, manifested in human flesh through the prophet Moses. And that is why at the end time we have the promise of the coming of Moses for the second time, and of the coming of Elijah for the fifth time, and of the coming of Jesus for the second time. These are the three great ministries promised to be manifested at the last day in the coming of the Son of Man, in the coming of the Angel of the Covenant, in the coming of the Angel of the Lord, which is the coming of Jesus Christ in Holy Spirit, veiled and revealed in his angel messenger among the heavenly Israel, making known to them all these things which must surely be done. And then, Jesus Christ in Holy Spirit will be among the Hebrew people, manifested in his angel messenger, also making known to them all these things pertaining to this end time. And the Hebrew people will receive him. 144,000 Hebrews are appointed in Revelation chapter 7 and Revelation chapter 14, to receive the coming of the angel of the covenant of the angel of the Lord, of Jesus Christ in Holy Spirit manifested in human flesh through his angel messenger, which is the angel who comes with the seal of the living God in Revelation chapter 7, which is the seal of the living God. The seal of the living God is the Holy Spirit. And Jesus Christ in Holy Spirit who is the angel of the covenant, will be veiled in human flesh and revealed through human flesh. First, the heavenly Israel, which is the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, and then to the earthly Israel, which is the Hebrew people. And the Hebrew people will receive him. And the church of the Lord Jesus Christ at this last day in the age of the cornerstone where a new dispensation opens, the dispensation of the kingdom will also receive him. All those were found written in the Lamb's book of life just like all those among the Hebrew people who are found written in the Lamb's Book of Life, which are 144,000 Hebrews, 12,000 of each tribe will also receive him, because Christ said, My sheep hear my voice, and they follow me. He also said that he would call them by name, and that Christ know the name of his sheep? Of course. For he has them written where? In the Lamb's Book of Life, which is this book of the seven seals. That is why this book of the seven seals is so important, because the names of all those who would be redeemed by Jesus Christ in and with his sacrifice carried out on Calvary's cross are found there. And through the sacrifice of Christ on Calvary's cross, all of creation receives its redemption. And since this book contains all of creation, it is the title deed of all creation, including the whole universe. And all human beings 
who are in the original, in the original program that God had in his mind originally, meaning from the beginning, we find that by taking and opening this book, the restoration comes for all of God's sons and daughters. Restoration to turn alive to obtain our inheritance, which Adam and Eve lost in the beginning, but which at the end time we find will be restored by the second Adam, but our beloved Lord Jesus Christ. He paid the prize of redemption on Calvary's cross. And at this end time, he will be claiming everything he redeemed there in Calvary's cross, everything he purchased there in Calvary's cross with his sacrifice. And now we find that this book of the seven seals or seven sealed book is more important than what we can imagine. It is so important that, notice, no human being was found worthy in heaven nor on earth neither under the earth. And weren't the prophets present in heaven? Moses, Abraham, and all these people? Yes, but they had come to earth through the unit of a man and a woman, and they had already come contaminated by sin. Therefore, they couldn't take the book. It had to be a human being who had come to earth without sin. Adam had come without sin, but he had fallen. And he had lost the rights to that book. And there's only one after Adam. And it is the second Adam, our beloved Lord Jesus Christ, who came by divine creation. He came by divine creation. God created that cell of life in Mary's womb, which multiplied cell after cell and formed the body of Jesus. But when the call is, was made for someone to come forward there in heaven and take this book, Jesus was not appearing. And no other man was worthy to take that book and open those seals. John wept so much because he knew that unless someone worthy to take that book and open those seals appeared, everything would be lost. Everything would go back to what it was before creation. And only God would remain because God is eternal. That is why John wept so much. But notice the elder told John, John, don't weep. Perhaps John didn't know the program that would be carried out there in heaven where Jesus Christ would take that book because he was the one who paid the prize of redemption and therefore he is the owner of and the heir of that title deed, and therefore of all creation. And now notice, John didn't know what was going to happen, but the elder tells John, John weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah who has prevailed. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David hath prevailed to open the book and to lose the seven seals thereof. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts and in the midst of the elders, 
stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. Now, what the elder said here is a mystery. When he said, Behold, the line of the tribe of Judah, and when John looked, what he saw was a lamb. Was the elder mistaken when he said it was a lion? Which when John looked, it, it was a lamb? Or was John mistaken when he looked and he didn't see the one the elder had pointed him to? The elder pointed him to the lion of the tribe of Judah and John saw the Lamb of God. What is the mystery there? Well, that the lion of the tribe of Judah and the Lamb of God are the same person. It is our beloved Lord Jesus Christ. So John didn't see a lion or a lamb. Rather, he saw a man who is the lion of the tribe of Judah and the Lamb of God who took away the sin of the world there in Calvary's cross. But... Because Christ takes a title deed as the Lion of the tribe of Judah, as King of Kings and Lord of Lords, to make his claim, the elder introduces him as the Lion of the tribe of Judah. John the Baptist had introduced Jesus as the Lamb of God 2,000 years ago because he would carry out the work of the Lamb of God on Calvary's cross, and he would take away the sin of the world. He would pay the price of redemption so that he could redeem all of creation, redeem every son and daughter of God, every soul of God, every person whose name is written in that book of the seven seals, which is the Lamb's book of life. And now notice how the line of the tribe of Judah, which is the same Lamb of God, takes a book and opens it. And why hadn't he come forward before when the call was made and John was weeping for a certain time because no one was appearing? Because... Where was Jesus Christ, the Lion of the tribe of Judah and Lamb of God? He was on the throne of intercession in heaven, making intercession for every person whose name is written in that book. And he couldn't leave the throne of intercession until he had made intercession with his blood for the very last of those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. In other words, when the call is made, we find that Christ is making intercession for the last elect of God, for the last elect of God, whom he would be calling and gathering at the last day with the great sound of a trumpet. Because in St. Matthew chapter 24, verse 30 to 31, it tells us that he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet and they shall gather together his elect. And unto all the elect of God, which are the people whose names have been written in the Lamb's Book of Life before the foundation of the world, which in the Scripture are the people called the elect of God, the firstborn of God, written in heaven. Notice, those people must come first. So that they are washed in the blood of Christ, and when the number of those people is completed, then Christ 
can leave the throne of intercession in heaven. Now notice these people are here in the scripture. St. Paul says, referring to these people, in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 22 to 23, he says, But ye are come unto Mount Zion, and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels to the general assembly and church of the firstborn which are written in heaven. Who are the firstborn? They are the people whose names are written in heaven in the Lamb's book of life, in other words, in this book of the seven seals. These people are the ones who throughout all this time that has been passing and this time in which we're living would receive Christ as their Savior, wash away their sins in the blood of Christ and receive His Holy Spirit. And the new birth would be fulfilled in them, would be carried out in them, which Jesus Christ spoke to Nicodemus about in chapter 3 of St. John, what he told Nicodemus, these very meaningful words saying, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. In other words, he cannot understand it. Nicodemus said unto him, How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Nicodemus thought it was by being born again through a woman. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Now, Christ speaks to him about a new birth, and he tells him, Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. In order for a person to enter and become a part of the mystical body of Christ, meaning of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, he needs to believe in Christ as our Savior, and he needs to wash away his sins in the blood of Christ, and receive as Holy Spirit. And thus, the new birth is carried out in the person, and the person receives a theophanic spirit of the sixth dimension. The sixth dimension is paradise. That is the dimension of the Word. That is the dimension of the theophany. And from there he receives a theophanic body, a theophanic spirit that comes from the Spirit of God, from the Holy Spirit, from that theophanic Spirit of God. And the person comes into eternal life and he comes into the program of restoration to eternal life. He comes into the program of restoration of everything and to everything that Adam and Eve lost in the fall. Notice, once we're born here on earth, we have received the spirit of the world, and we have received a body in God's permissive will. And now, by believing in Christ as our Savior, and washing away our sins in the blood of Christ, and receiving a spirit, we receive a spirit of heaven, a spirit of the sixth dimension, meaning of paradise. And... If the person dies later on, there is no problem. He goes on to live in paradise with and in that theophanic body of the sixth dimension. And what is the theophanic body of the sixth dimension like? Well, it is a body similar to the body we have, but from another dimension. And then 
The person stays there in paradise, which is a dimension, a world similar to ours, but without the problems we have here on earth. A place where there are trees, there are birds, there is grass, there are animals too. It is what we call paradise. And there, people live in the theophanic body of the sixth dimension. That is the type of body in which God appeared to Abraham as Melchizedek and as Elohim. And then we find that at the last day, Jesus Christ has said, referring to the people who have believed in him, notice first he tells us in St. John chapter 5, verse 24, he says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Every person who has believed in Christ as his Savior and has washed away his sins in the blood of Christ and has received his Holy Spirit has passed from death unto life. He has passed from death to life. When we have come to this earth, we have come to a valley of shadow and death, but when we have believed in Christ and received the Spirit, we have passed to eternal life. And thus, we then obtain a body of paradise of heaven of the sixth dimension. And at the last day, there is a great blessing for all those people, even though their physical bodies may have died. There is no problem for them because they are in paradise. And for us who are alive and believe in Christ as our Savior and have washed away our sins in the blood of Christ and have received His Holy Spirit, there are no problems either. Notice what Christ has promised for the last day. He says, chapter 6, verses 39 to 40 of St. John says, and this is the Father's will which hath sent me, that of all which he had given me I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. When does Christ say that he will raise all those whom the Father has given him? He says it will be at the last day. He goes on to say, And this is the will of him that hath sent me, and that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth in him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. When does Christ say that he will raise all those who have believed in him and have washed away their sins in the blood of Christ, the Lamb of God, and have received the Spirit, he says that at the last day is when he will raise him up. This is for those who have already departed. And for us who are alive, what he will do is change us. He will change our bodies as he promised. And then we will have an eternal body and we will be in the image and likeness of our beloved Lord Jesus Christ. And in that body, we will all be young, representing the age of 18 to 21 years for all eternity. The divine body is the same way. Those who are living in paradise are all people who represent the age of 18 to 21. There are no children there, nor elderly people. Everyone is young, because such is the divine body of the sixth dimension.
and the physical and eternal body that we will receive will be like that too, young for all eternity, because there will be no reason for it to get old, because we will all be restored to eternal life with eternal bodies, and we will be in the image and likeness of our beloved Lord Jesus Christ. He said, Except the corn of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it abides alone. But if it falls in the ground and dies, it brings forth much fruit. Speaking about the Son of Man, in other words, speaking about himself and his death on Calvary's cross. If Christ hadn't died on Calvary's cross, what would have happened? Human beings would all have all had to die that day Christ died because the time of the divine judgment for the human race had come. And what would have happened to Jesus Christ? Well, he wouldn't have died. Why? Because he didn't have sin. And if he didn't have sin, then he couldn't die. That is why he said, No man takes my life from me. I lay down on myself to take it again. Now, if Christ hadn't died, on Calvary's cross, he would still be living here, walking throughout the earth, but alone. Except a corn of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it abides alone. And what would be? What would be the meaning and importance of a planet like the planet Earth with only one man on Earth walking back and forth without other people to talk to and have fellowship with? Even animals wouldn't have been able to continue living. A lonely man on this earth, that is not the divine program. The divine program is that this earth be filled with human beings, sons and daughters of God, and that is why Christ had to die. But if it falls into the ground and dies, it brings forth much fruit. In other words, when a corn of wheat is sown, then that corn of wheat sprouts in the form of a plant. But it is a corn of wheat that has taken another form to be able to reproduce itself and bring forth more fruit, many wheat grains, just like itself, in the image and likeness of the corn of wheat that was sown into the ground. And now Jesus Christ, notice, we find that he died on Calvary's cross, rose and ascended to heaven. And on the day of Pentecost, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ was born. The same life that was in Jesus Christ, the same Spirit of God that was in Jesus Christ, came upon 120 people who were in the upper room. And the church of the Lord Jesus Christ was born there. The corn of wheat sprouted there in the form of a plant. The corn of wheat Jesus Christ sprouted in the form of his church there. And the church of the Lord Jesus Christ has been growing from age to age, from stage to stage. And it has been formed, it is being formed by human beings who are written in the Lamb's Book of Life in the seven-sealed book. And from stage to stage, that wheat plant has been growing. It is the mystical body of Jesus Christ. It has been growing. And all the people who have been part of the church of Jesus Christ in the past have been the wheat grains, potentially, that the corn of wheat would bring forth. 
el grano de trigo que fue sembrado en tierra the corn of wheat that was sown into the ground would reproduce himself in sons and daughters of God which are those wheat grains that he would bring forth and now at the last day we are in the stage of the top of the wheat plant la planta de trigo en donde where God's sons and daughters are called and gathered in the age of the cornerstone and dispensation of the kingdom, which is the age or stage of the wheat grains, which will be in the image and likeness of our beloved Lord Jesus Christ, which will be changed and be like our beloved Lord Jesus Christ. And the saints who have departed in the past ages will be raised and will also be in the image and likeness of our beloved Lord Jesus Christ. And thus we will all be restored to eternal life. We will be restored to everything Adam and Eve lost back in the fall in the Garden of Eden. St. Paul the Apostle, speaking of this great event pertaining to the last day, tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 49 and on, let's see here, here he speaks to us about the first Adam and the second Adam. If we read from 45 and on, we will have a clear picture. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 45 to 54 tells us. And so it is written, The first Adam was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Howbeit that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterwards that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As in the earthy, such are they also that are earthy. And as in the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. In other words, we will bear the image of Jesus Christ, who is the second Adam, the heavenly. <coughs> now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. In other words, we cannot expect to live eternally in a corruptible body without corruption setting in into this mortal, corruptible, and temporary body. We have to obtain an incorruptible and immortal body. And how are we going to obtain it? It says, Behold, I show you a mystery. Of course it is a mystery. How are we going to obtain an eternal, immortal, incorruptible body to live for all eternity? That is a mystery. But let's see how St. Paul explains this mystery to us. He says, We shall not all sleep. In other words, we won't all die. But we shall all be changed. There is a transformation coming for our mortal bodies. We will be transformed, changed in our atoms. And then we will have an eternal body. That is what God has promised. For whom? For the believers in Christ who have washed away their sins in the blood of Christ and have received the Spirit, both for us who are alive and for those who have already departed in past times. He goes on to say, In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, notice it is very important to understand that there is a last trumpet. And when a trump 
or trumpet is mentioned that is referring to the voice of God, the voice of Jesus Christ speaking on this earth through a prophet. At the last trump, or the trumpet shall sound, in other words, that trumpet will sound, it will be blown. When the last trumpet is mentioned, that is the voice of Christ speaking for the last time. The voice of Christ giving us his last message. And there's only one last message promised for the last day. It is the message of the gospel of the kingdom. That is the last trumpet mentioned by Jesus Christ in Matthew 24, verse 31, as the great sound of a trumpet which the angels of the Son of Man are sent with. He says, and he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect. It says, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. The dead in Christ will be raised in immortal bodies, in incorruptible bodies, in eternal bodies. All, they will all return to earth in an eternal young body to live for all eternity. And we who are alive will be changed and we will also have the eternal body. Now notice that this is for the time of the last trumpet. I told you that the last trumpet is the message of the gospel of the kingdom, which is the message of Jesus Christ for the last day. The message of the gospel of the kingdom revolves around the second coming of Christ as the line of the tribe of Judah, as king of kings and lord of lords in his claiming work. It is the coming of the Son of Man with his angels is the center, the axis that the message of the gospel of the kingdom revolves around. Just like the message of the gospel of grace revolves around the first coming of Christ as the Lamb of God taking away our sins on Calvary's cross, washing us from our sins with His precious blood shed on Calvary's cross. Now we have seen what the last trumpet or great voice of trumpet is. It is the message of the gospel of the kingdom being proclaimed, being preached at the last day. And what is or which is the last day? Since one day before the Lord is like a thousand years and a thousand years like one day, when God speaks to us about the last day before him, that is the last millennium to human beings. And when the scripture tells us about the last days before God, that is referred to the last millenniums to human beings. The last millenniums to human beings are the fifth millennium, sixth millennium, and seventh millennium. That is why when St. Paul the Apostle speaks to us about the manifestation of God through Jesus Christ, through Jesus when he tells him that God spoke through Jesus Christ, and you know in which time he says that he spoke through Jesus Christ, he says that he spoke through Jesus Christ in the last days. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 to 2, St. Paul says, God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, 
whom he had appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the world. When does St. Paul say that God spoke through his Son? He says, in these last days, and two thousand years have already passed, and we still are in the last days. When Jesus Christ was 47 years old, the fifth millennium began, and therefore the last days began, and that is why the ministry of Jesus Christ was in the last days, in the first of the last days, in the first century of the fifth millennium. And now, seeing that the last days are the last millennium to human beings, in other words, the fifth, sixth, and seventh millennium, therefore, we understand that the last day is the seventh millennium millennium. And if we add to the calendar the years it is behind, then we're already in the seventh millennium. If we don't add to the calendar the years it is behind, then there are only three years left for the sixth millennium to end and for the seventh millennium to begin. And now notice that Christ's promise of the resurrection of the dead in Christ he says it will be at the last day and I will raise him up when? At the last day. In other words, in the seventh millennium. Now, which year of the seventh millennium? We don't know, but let's wait until the resurrection takes place and then let's look at the calendar and then we will find out which year the resurrection of the dead in Christ was meant for. And after the resurrection of the dead in Christ, they will appear to God select who will be alive at this time. And when that happens, and we see them risen, that is when we will be changed. And we will also receive the eternal body. We will put on immortality, immortal bodies, to live for all eternity. And it is for the last day because at the last day is when the last trumpet will be sounding. In other words, when the message of the trumpet of the gospel of the kingdom will be preached to all human beings, starting from the territory where the age of the cornerstone is being fulfilled, starting from the territory or around the territory where God is calling and gathering his elect with that great voice of trumpet, meaning with that message of the gospel of the kingdom, where he will be making known to them the mystery of the coming of the Son of Man with his angels for this last day. And now, let's see what St. Paul goes on to say here. We have seen that he says, For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put in corruption, and this mortal shall have put immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. From that point on, there will be no more death for our bodies because we will have an immortal body. We have seen that there is a biblical promise for all of God's sons and daughters, a biblical promise of a new body for each of you and also for me and for the saints of the past ages who have departed in order to live for all eternity. We have seen that when we are in that body is when we will be in the image and likeness of Jesus Christ in all his fullness.
and we will reign with Christ over this earth for a thousand years. That's just to get started. And then for all eternity. In Revelation chapter 1, Verses 5 to 6, it says, And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful and witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Through his sacrifice on Calvary's cross, he washed us from our sins and made us kings and priests. And in Revelation chapter 5, verses 8 to 10, it says, And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of saints. And they sung, a new song saying thou art worthy to take the book to take which book? what book? the book of the seven seals and to open the seals thereof for thou wast slain and has redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. In other words, out of all the kindreds and all the people and nations on this earth, because God's sons and daughters have heard the voice of Christ and they come from different peoples, nations and tongues, from all the peoples, nations and tongues on this earth. It goes on to say, and has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. Will we reign or not? Of course we will. We will reign with Christ in his glorious millennial kingdom, and then for all eternity. And in Revelation chapter 20, verse 4 and on, it says, And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads, or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Notice how these kings and priests reigned with Christ a thousand years, and then for all eternity, he says, but the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. And such, the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Now notice how we will be living in the glorious kingdom of Jesus Christ. We won't be living the way we we'll live in the gentle kingdom nowadays. Where some have a job, some gentlemen have a job as an office worker or as a construction worker, others have this or that job and ladies while well, they work in one thing or another or in their homes and so on 
But in the glorious millennial kingdom of Christ, our position is kings and priests. And we will reign with Christ a thousand years and then for all eternity. Christ will reign over the evil people and we will reign with him. Christ will reign over the whole earth, over all the nations, peoples and tongues and every human being and we will reign with him too. That is the promise given by Christ for all those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Now, a person whose name is written there can never be blotted out of that book. That is a person who, at some moment in his life, will see the light of God. He will believe in Christ as his Savior, wash away his sins in the blood of Christ, and receive his Holy Spirit. For Christ is the one who will be seeking his sheep. And... This is not of him that wills, nor of him that runs, but of God who shows mercy. In St. John chapter 11, verse 51 to 52, it tells us what the high priest spoke about Jesus and about Jesus having to die, it says. And this speaking not of himself, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus should die for that nation, and not for that nation only, but that also he should gather together in one the children of God that were scattered abroad, in other words, dispersed, scattered throughout the whole world from age to age and from generation to generation. And now, with his death, Christ would bring together, gather together in one the sons and daughters of God. And how can he do it? Gather them together in one by calling and gathering them and bringing forth the new birth in them and putting them in his mystical body, one body, the mystical body of Christ. We are all there as one in Christ. In St. John chapter 10, verses 14 to 16, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known of mine. As the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, meaning that they are not of the Hebrew people. Them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. They will hear the voice of the Good Shepherd. From age to age, we find that the Good Shepherd, Jesus Christ, has been manifested in Holy Spirit through each angel messenger in each stage, each age of His Church, and in each territory where each age of the Church of the Lord Jesus Christ has been fulfilled, and Christ has been manifested in in Holy Spirit, in each one of those messengers, speaking and calling and gathering his sheep, gathering them where? In his mystical body of believers, which is his church. He says, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. That fold is the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, and that shepherd is our beloved Lord Jesus Christ. And now we have seen that from age to age, from stage to stage, Christ has been calling and gathering his sheep. We have the diagram that Reverend William Branham used in the message, the stature of a perfect man. 
where he showed the church of the Lord Jesus Christ this way. And this is a diagram. And he put the time of the apostles of St. Peter and the other apostles down here. And then he put the first stage or age of the church of Jesus Christ among the Gentiles. And he put St. Paul as the first angel messenger of the Lord Jesus Christ for the first age or age of his church among the Gentiles. And St. Paul said, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. Jesus Christ was in Holy Spirit, was manifested in St. Paul, and he was speaking through St. Paul, and he was calling and gathering his sheep. We find that this happened under the ministry of St. Paul the Apostle. That is what from stage to stage under the ministry of St. Paul, God select heard the voice of God. In the book of Acts, chapter 13, verses 46 to 49, we find St. Paul preaching and those whom God ordained to eternal life receiving the word of God. It says, chapter 13, verses 46 to 49 of the book of Acts says, Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you, to the Jews first. But seeing ye put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. For so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee to be a light of the Gentiles, that thou shouldest be for salvation unto the ends of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord, and as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. As many as were ordained to eternal life believed. Ordained by whom? By God. They had their names written in the Lamb's Book of Life. In other words, in this book of the seven seals. And as many as were ordained to eternal life, believed. And the word of the Lord was published throughout all the region. We also find in the time of St. Peter, when he preached the word, we find that in that stage, God was also adding to the church those who were ordained to eternal life. And we find that Christ said, He that is of God hears God's voice. In other words, he whose name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life before the foundation of the world is a child of God, and therefore he hears his Father's voice, God's voice. My sheep hear my voice, and they follow me. He says, he calls them by name, for their names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And now, seeing this program that Christ has been carrying out, which we can see in this diagram, from age to age, Christ, through the messenger of each age, has been calling and gathering his sheep in each age in the territory where each age has been fulfilled. First, in Asia Minor, the first stage of the church among the Gentiles. Then in Europe, where five stages of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ were fulfilled, and where Christ sent five messengers through whom Jesus Christ in Holy Spirit manifested himself and spoke through them and called and gathered his sheep in 
those different European territories where these five stages of the gentle church were fulfilled. The second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth stages were fulfilled. The sixth stage was fulfilled there in England, and the messenger was John Wesley. And then, Jesus Christ in Holy Spirit flew from England, from Europe, and flew to North America. In North America, he sent his messenger, Reverend William Marion Branham, also as forerunner of the second coming of Christ, and as the messenger of the seventh stage for each of the gentle church. He sent him in the spirit and power of Elijah. It's not that it was literally Elijah, but that the Holy Spirit operated the ministry of Elijah in him for the fourth time. And through that messenger in North America, he called and gathered his elect pertaining to the seventh stage or age of the gentle church. From North America, the message of Christ spread to other nations. The message of Jesus Christ through that prophet messenger of Jesus Christ. And... Once the seventh stage or age of the gentle church in North America has ended, where has Jesus Christ and Holy Spirit gone? Because wherever he has gone is where God's elect will be, God's firstborn who will be called in this last day. In other words, in the territory where Jesus Christ in Holy Spirit has gone, that is where the elect are, who will hear the voice of Christ, the great voice of trumpet, calling and gathering all of God's elect. From North America, Jesus Christ in Holy Spirit has gone to Latin America and the Caribbean to call and gather all his elect, which are Latin American and Caribbean people, to call them at this last day with the message of the last trumpet, of that great voice of trumpet, which is the message of the gospel of the kingdom, which contains the divine revelation of the second coming of Christ as the line of the tribe of Judah, as king of kings and lord of lords, in his claiming work. And through that message of the gospel of the kingdom, which revolves around the second coming of Christ, God's elect in Latin America and the Caribbean are called and gathered at this last day in the age of the cornerstone, which is the age of love divine, which is the age where God's elect will be, who will be changed at the last day and will become in the image and likeness of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the dead in Christ of past ages will be raised at the last day, in other words, in the seventh millennium. Now, in which year of the seventh millennium? We don't know, but let's wait for the resurrection to take place. And after the resurrection, we will be changed. Now, it is good news for the Latin American and Caribbean people that the Spirit of Christ has gone to Latin America and the Caribbean to manifest himself at this last day. And with the great voice of trumpet or last trumpet to call and gather his elect. Just as Jesus Christ in Holy Spirit was in each messenger of past ages at the last day, he will also be in a messenger. And Christ said in Revelation chapter 4, verse 1, Come up hither, where do we have to go up to? The age of the cornerstone. Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. And then, in Revelation chapter 22, verse 6, it says, And he said unto me, These sayings are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel. And now, what has he sent him for? It says, sent his angel 
to show to his servants the things which must shortly be done. Why does he send him to show his servants the things which must surely be done. All these things which must surely be done in the seventh millennium at the last day, all these things which must happen in the age of the cornerstone, and all these things which must happen in Latin America and the Caribbean, and then among the Hebrew people, and in the whole earth are made known to God's sons and daughters through the angel of the Lord Jesus Christ, where Jesus Christ in Holy Spirit will be manifested at the last day. Now, the angel of the Lord Jesus Christ is not the Lord Jesus Christ. He is only his prophet messenger for the age of the cornerstone and dispensation of the kingdom. He is a dispensational prophet whom Jesus Christ at the last day will be sending in the age of the cornerstone and dispensation of the kingdom in the territory where the age of the cornerstone is fulfilled and the dispensation of the kingdom is open, which is the Latin American and Caribbean territory. So that Christ, through that messenger, makes known to us all these things which must surely be done. That is why he also tells us in Revelation chapter 22, verse 16, Ah, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. Whom does Jesus Christ say he has sent? His angel messenger. He is the one sent by Jesus Christ so that Jesus Christ in Holy Spirit manifests himself through him and makes known to us all these things which must surely be done. That angel is at one time by Jesus Christ and sent of Jesus Christ to all churches and to all human beings with the message of the gospel of the kingdom. And through him comes the divine revelation of all these things which must surely be done. And that is how we obtain the knowledge of all the things that must happen at this end time in which we are living. And thus, we will be prepared to be changed and raptured at this last day. Now, what does all of this have to do with the seven seals of Revelation? This is contained in this book of the seven seals. Just as what has already happened from Christ to this time is contained in this book of the seven seals. For example, we have the white horse rider of Revelation chapter 6 verse, verse 1 to 2 who had a crown he had a bow and a crown was also given to him and went forth conquering and to conquer that rider is the Antichrist who has been moving since past times. Then we have the second seal in Revelation chapter 6 verses 3 to 4 where the rider appears in a red horse and power was given to him to take peace from the earth and that they should kill one another. Let's read it exactly as it says here. The first one, under the first seal, it says, I saw 
And behold, a white horse, this is, and I saw when the Lamb opened the, one of the seals that I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and it went forth conquering and to conquer. I told you, this is the Antichrist who has come since the past. And then we have the second seal. It says, And when he had opened the second seal, it says, Revelation 6, verse 3 and on, I heard the second beast say, Come and see. And there went out another horse that was red, and power was given to him that sat there to take peace from the earth and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. It is the same Antichrist changing horses, meaning, or rather, the same horse changing colors. Then, in Revelation chapter 6, verses 5 to 6, we find the third seal. It says, And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see. And I beheld, and lo, a black horse. And he that sat in him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny. And see, thou heard not, the oil and the wine. The oil and the wine represent God's sons and daughters who are filled with the oil, which is the Holy Spirit, and are stimulated by the wine of divine revelation. Then we find the fourth seal, chapter 6, verses 7 to 8, where it says, And when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the four beasts say, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was Death, and hell followed with him. And power was given unto him over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword and with hunger and with death and with the beast of the earth. It is the same Antichrist, notice, and his horse changing colors. It changed from white to red, and then it changed from red to black. The horse changed colors, and then it changed here from black to pale. And his name is Death. That is the stage where the devil is incarnated in all his fullness, in the Antichrist, in the man of sin, in the beast. And at the last day, he will demand a mark on the hand or on the forehead that speaks of subjection or of obedience, of being subjected to the Antichrist and having his teaching, his doctrine. Because the empire of the Antichrist will also have its religion, just as all empires have had the official religion of that empire. Likewise, the empire of the Antichrist will also have its official religion, and that is a satanic religion, because death follows him, and his death is death. And we find that in Revelation chapter 13 and Revelation chapter 16 and 17, we find how all that is going to unfold. That rider is the same one who has the number 666, which is the number of a man.
That pale horse rider, who is the devil incarnated in the Antichrist, in the false prophet and the man of sin, will have his kingdom well established at the end time. And whoever doesn't have the mark of the beast or the number or his name will not be able to buy or sell. Now, during the Great Tribulation, it will be very difficult for human beings who will be living here on earth because the devil will be incarnated in all his fullness in the Antichrist and the man of sin. And that pale horse rider, and in that pale horse rider is where the devil will be incarnated, manifested in all his fullness, and he will be manifested in that empire of the Antichrist represented in the feet of iron and clay. Before the Great Tribulation begins, a squeeze will come upon God's sons and daughters. But during that stage, the dead in Christ will rise and we who are alive will be changed. Christ will be manifested here on earth through his angel messenger, making known to us all these things which must surely be done. And the Antichrist, the beast, will persecute Christ manifested in his angel, but Christ will obtain the victory over the beast and over the devil. In Revelation chapter 17, verse 11 and on, it says, And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth, and is of the seven, and goeth into perdition. See, his name is death, in Revelation chapter 6, and hell follows him. And here it says that he goes into perdition. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but received power as kings one hour with the beast. These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them. For he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. Those who are with him are God's elect, God's firstborn. And here, notice, the Lamb is King of kings, and Lord of Lords. At that time, Christ will change from Lamb to Lion of the tribe of Judah, and it's as the Lion of the tribe of Judah that Jesus Christ is the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That is why the taking and opening of that seven seal book is so important. That is why it is so important that those seven seals be opened. For the claim over everything that Christ has redeemed with his precious blood to restore to eternal life all the elect whose names are written in this book of the seven seals, in this book, in this Lamb's book of life that God has in his right hand, in his hand, and that Christ at the end time will take and open in heaven and then bring to earth. And now, 
we have seen that this isn't just any book. It is the most important book on earth and also in heaven. No book is more important than this book of the seven seals. And during these stages or ages of the Church of the Lord Jesus Christ represented here in this diagram the content of the seven seal book has been in fulfillment. And in the age of the cornerstone there are seals that must be fulfilled at this end time. For example, the fourth seal, the sixth seal, and the seventh seal are open during the time when the age of the cornerstone is being fulfilled. And notice, we find that the fourth seal is the manifestation of the devil through human flesh in the Antichrist in the man of sin. The fifth seal is, let's see here, so we have a clear picture. Under the seals, notice, Things happen from God and also from the devil because all the work that will be carried out is contained there. Both the work that Christ will carry out as well as the work that the devil will carry out. In other words, everything is there in symbols. It is revealed there, but in symbols, and with the opening of this book, these symbols are open to all of God's sons and daughters. In other words, the history of the human race from Christ to now is contained in this seven-sealed book, but it is there in symbolic form. And thus, the history has not been altered. Rather, it is being fulfilled from stage to stage. And now, at the end time, we find that there is a group of souls here. In chapter 6, verse 9 and on, it says, and when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. Now, it doesn't say for the testimony of Jesus. Why? Because these people are Hebrews, in other words, Jews, who have died as martyrs for being Hebrews under these persecutions that have come upon the Hebrew people. Because they rejected Christ as the Messiah, they asked for his death and said, His blood be on us and on our children. And the blood of Christ has been required of the Hebrew people. Their temple was destroyed, and they had no place to carry out the sin offering on the tenth day of the seventh month of each, every year. And therefore, the Hebrew people's reconciliation with God could not be carried out. And from year to year, they have not had the atonement for the reconciliation, and therefore, the divine judgment has been falling upon the Hebrew people because they have not been reconciled with God, because they have not had the temple there in Jerusalem. They have not had the sin offering, and so they have not been able to carry out their reconciliation with God. And the divine judgment has been falling upon the Hebrew people. They haven't had the sacrifices to cover sin because they haven't had a temple. And the only sacrifice that God accepts is the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, and they rejected him. Therefore, 
their sins are seen before God. And thus, that requires divine judgment. And they have been under the divine judgment throughout these 2,000 years or so after the death of Christ, since the death of Christ and now, and they have been under the divine judgment. Some people can understand why the Hebrew people have been suffering so much, but that has been the reason. But the Hebrew people at this last day, in the seventh millennium, will have an opportunity where God will deal with the Hebrew people for three and a half years, which is the second part of the 70th week of Daniel's prophecy. And where God will confirm the covenant to the Hebrew people. St. Paul, as a Hebrew from the tribe of Benjamin and as a very zealous believer of the Word of God speaking to us about the Hebrew people in Romans chapter 11, verses 25 to 27, says to us, for I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits. The blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. In other words, until the very last elect of God has come into the mystical body of Jesus Christ. And for that to happen, the call of the great voice of trumpet must be made, which is the call of Jesus Christ through his angel messenger calling and gathering together his elect with the message of the gospel of the kingdom. And when the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, when the very last member of the mystical body of Christ has come in, it says, And so all Israel shall be saved, as it is written, There shall come out of Zion the Deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob, for this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins. See, until God has taken away the sins of the Hebrew people, the divine judgment will be upon the Hebrew people. And now, at the last day, there will be a group of 144,000 Hebrews that appear in Revelation chapter 7 who will believe and turn to Christ and who will receive the message of the gospel of the kingdom which revolves around the second coming of Christ. In other words, they will receive the second coming of Christ as a line of the tribe of Judah, as king of kings and lord of lords in his claiming work. The Hebrew people are waiting for the coming of the Messiah, the coming of the King of Israel. They're in their land. And many times they set up banners that say, Welcome, Messiah, because they're waiting for the coming of the Messiah. About two years ago, a red heifer was born in the land of Israel. And they are under much expectation because since the time the temple was destroyed in the year 70 of the Christian era, a red heifer had not been born among the Hebrew people. It used to be with a red heifer sacrificed to God, which was burned, and they made the waters of separation with it. 
And now the Hebrew people are under expectation because they say, this is a sign for the coming of the Messiah. It is a sign. Therefore, the Messiah will be with us any moment here in the land of Israel. And they are waiting for the coming of the Messiah. And they see the birth of that red heifer as a sign of the coming of the Messiah, of the King of Israel, and they're waiting for him. Now, these Hebrews or Jews who died during these persecutions were Hitler, Mussolini, and Stalin, and other dictators and rulers killed Hebrews, Jews, by the millions because they were Jews and came to feel hatred for them. And many of them said the Jews should be exterminated. All of this was because of the divine judgment that was falling upon the Hebrew people. And now those people do not perish. It says that they died. These souls of these people who have died, it says that they died for the word of God and for the testimony they held. They were believers in the message of Moses, in the law of Moses, in God's commandments through the prophet Moses. Therefore, they remained steadfast and died. But they died as believers in God and in God's commandments given through the prophet Moses. They stayed in the dispensation of law and gave their lives because they were Jews. And their souls, notice, are here under the altar of God. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, does thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? Because the dwellers on earth, the different nations that have persecuted the Hebrew people, notice, and that killed Hebrews, now they are asking for vengeance and God's vengeance for all those who have mistreated the Hebrews will come upon those nations. And white robes were given unto every one of them. And it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. And who are those who will be killed as they were? They are the 144,000 Hebrews who will also be martyred. They will be killed by the beast, the Antichrist, the man of sin, who will send armies and kill them. And he will kill many other people among the Hebrew people, and many other people, or millions of people, of other nations too. In Revelation chapter 12, we find everything that will happen there. And now, notice how God speaks to us here about these souls. And white robes were given unto every one of them. So, they receive a theophanic body. They're put there in that section of paradise. And they wait there until the time appointed by God is fulfilled. Then we go on to the sixth seal, chapter 6, verse 12 and on, of the book of Revelation, where it says, And I beheld 
when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. And the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scrawl when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth and the great men and the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every month men and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come, and who shall be able to stand? The great day of his wrath is the great tribulation. It is three and a half years during which God's wrath will be poured out upon all the nations. And who will be able to stand at that time? There will be earthquakes, tidal waves, or tsunamis. That time starts with a great earthquake. It says that the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, the moon became as blood, the stars of heaven fell, and it goes on to list all the things that happened during that time. It is the time of the wrath of the Lamb. It is the time of the day of vengeance of our God, when God will avenge the blood of these Hebrews who have been martyred, killed by these nations who have persecuted and killed the Hebrews. And God told Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Blessed is he that blesses you, and cursed is he that curses you. All those who have persecuted the Hebrews and killed the Hebrews have brought that curse upon themselves. And those who have helped the Hebrews have brought God's blessing upon themselves. And those who have persecuted the church of the Lord Jesus Christ and have killed Christians have also brought God's curse upon them, the divine judgment, and those who have helped God's elect have brought God's blessings upon them. Christ said, Whosoever shall give to drink unto one of these my little ones a cup of cold water shall in no wise lose his reward, and his reward eternal life. In the parable that Christ gives in St. Matthew chapter 25, where the king sets the sheep in his right and the goats in his left, we find that he blesses the sheep and puts them in the kingdom of God to inherit the kingdom of God prepared from the foundation of the world. It says, for I was hungry, and you gave me meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to see me. And likewise, it goes on to list all the reasons why the sh those sheep that he sets on his rod will go into the kingdom prepared by God. And those sheep 
what human beings say. Notice. They ask, when saw we thee a stranger and took thee in, or naked and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick or in prison and came unto thee? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of these, least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Who are the least? of these, the brethren of Jesus Christ. They are the members of the mystical body of Christ. They are the people who have believed in Christ as their Savior, washed away in their sins in the blood of Christ, and received the Holy Spirit, and therefore they have been born again. They have been born into the kingdom of God. Those are the little ones that Christ speaks about, and those who have done them favors, who have acted well in favor of those little ones, these members, of the mystical body will not lose their reward. They will enter into the kingdom of God after Judgment Day. And there will also be nations that will go into the glorious millennial kingdom, the kingdom of Christ, because they will be nations where people will be helping these little ones in the last stage or age of the Church of Jesus Christ, which is the stage or age of the cornerstone. And where is that stage being fulfilled? Well, in Latin America and the Caribbean. And where are the firstborn, the elect of God at this last day? Well, here we are in Latin America and the Caribbean. Therefore, Latin America and the Caribbean has the opportunity to enter into the glorious millennial kingdom of Christ because in Latin America and the Caribbean is where the elect are being helped and they are being blessed. Therefore, those who will be helping God's elect of the last day will be blessed and if they are alive when the millennial kingdom begins, they will enter into that glorious millennial kingdom. And these Latin American and Caribbean countries will enter into the glorious millennial kingdom of our beloved Lord Jesus Christ. And the glorious millennial kingdom will be filled with Latin American and Caribbean people. And that is truly a great blessing for Latin America and the Caribbean. So, Latin American and the Caribbean does have a future. It has a future in the coming kingdom, in the glorious kingdom of our beloved Lord Jesus Christ. That America and the Caribbean may not have much of a future in this gentle kingdom, and it may not have a future in the kingdom of the Antichrist, but in the glorious kingdom of our beloved Lord Jesus Christ, it does have a future to enter into the glorious millennial kingdom of our beloved Lord Jesus Christ. Because the elect of the age of the cornerstone are in Latin America and the Caribbean, where a new dispensation opens up, the dispensation of the kingdom. So, youth were present. You have a wonderful future in the kingdom of God. And you adults too, you elderly people too, and you children too. We all have the most beautiful and glorious future than any person can have. Where we will be kings and priests, reigning with Christ a thousand years, and then for all eternity. Now notice, the goats won't go in. Jesus Christ says it will be because he was hungry and they gave him no food. 
Jesus Christ was thirsty and they didn't give him no drink. He was in jail and they didn't go to see him. He was sick and they didn't visit him and so on. And the goats will say, but when did we see you in need and not serve you? Christ says, in as much as you didn't do it to one of these, my little ones, you didn't do it to me either. And those people will go where? Let's see. We will let Christ himself say where those people will go. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. There are only two places. Some go to everlasting punishment, to the lake of fire, which is the second death, and others go to eternal life with our beloved Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we have seen this whole divine program that is contained in this book of the seven seals. The last seal pertains to the second coming of Christ, which appears in Revelation chapter 8, verse 1, where it says, and when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. The mystery contained in that seventh seal is the second coming of Christ. It is the coming of the Son of Man with his angels to reward every man according to his works. It is the coming of the Son of Man with his angels, sending his angels with a great sound of a trumpet and calling and gathering his elect at this last day where we would be living in the stage of the age of the cornerstone and dispensation of the kingdom and where Christ will be calling and gathering his elect of the last day in Latin America and the Caribbean. We have seen this book of the seven seals. We have seen the seven seals. We have also seen where we are in the divine program and we have seen that the mystery of the seven seal caused silence in heaven for about half an hour. During that half hour of silence in heaven, which represents years to human beings here on earth, very important things will be happening on earth according to the divine program. And everything that will be happening will revolve around the second coming of Christ, the coming of the Son of Man with his angels, which Christ spoke about on many occasions, as well as the apostles, the angel messengers of Jesus Christ, and also the prophets of the Old Testament. That seventh seal contains the secret of the second coming of Christ, a promise that will be fulfilled on this earth at the last day when Jesus Christ will come in Holy Spirit, veiled and revealed in human flesh through his last manifestation. And he will be revealing all these mysteries to us and he will be calling and gathering all his elect at this last day. Jesus Christ, through his angel messenger, will be calling us at this last day and will be revealing all these mysteries to us and will be preparing to us to be changed and raptured at this end time. God's elect of the last day will be called and gathered and the number of God's elect will be completed. And once the number of God's elect is completed, this title deed is taken by Christ in heaven. It is opened and brought to earth 
and cross leaves his work of intercession because he has already made intercession for everyone who would come in the end and the number of God's elect has been completed. Therefore, Christ, at this in time, at the last day, when the number of God's elect of the last day is completed, and it is completed here in the age of the cornerstone with Latin American and Caribbean people, then the dead in Christ will be raised in eternal bodies, and we who are alive will be changed, and then we will have the eternal body, and we will live for all eternity with our beloved Lord Jesus Christ. Notice the great blessings that Christ has in Latin America and the Caribbean at this last day in which we are living. And we have been given to live in the territory that has the blessing of Christ. We have been given to live in the territory where Jesus Christ and Holy Spirit would be manifested at the last day through his angel messenger, making known to us all these things which must surely come to pass, and thus preparing us to be changed and raptured and calling and gathering all his elect at this last day. All of this is under the seventh seal. And we are under the seventh seal at this last day, under the mystery contained in the seventh seal, to hear the voice of Christ and to be put in the mystical body of Christ, in the age of the cornerstone, and to be prepared to be changed and raptured at this last day. That is why the call of the great voice of trumpet, the call of the gospel of the kingdom, is covering all of Latin America and the Caribbean, because Christ, the good shepherd, is calling and gathering his last sheep, the last group, the group of the age of the cornerstone, to complete his fold with the sheep of the last day, and thus for his church to be completed. And for him to bring the resurrection of the dead in Christ and the transformation of us who are alive. We are living at the most glorious time of all times, the time in which Jesus Christ would make known to us all these things that would be happening in Latin America and the Caribbean under the mystery of these seals that pertain to this end time. And where are the ones who would hear the voice of the Good Shepherd at this last day? Well, here we are in Latin America and the Caribbean, in the age of the cornerstone, where a new dispensation has opened up the dispensation of the kingdom and Jesus Christ in Holy Spirit through his angel messenger would be making known to us all these things that would be happening at this end time. We are at the most glorious time for the Latin American and Caribbean people. And we are making the most of this blessing of Christ, this blessing that Christ would have for Latin America and the Caribbean. This is the greatest blessing he would have for any nation and then for the Hebrew people. May the blessings of Jesus Christ, the angel of the covenant, our Savior, be upon each one of you and also upon me. And soon may the number of God selecting the physical body of Christ be completed and soon may the dead in Christ rise, and may we who are alive be changed, and may we all have the eternal and glorious body that Christ has promised 
for us in the image and likeness of our beloved Lord Jesus Christ. In the eternal name of our Lord Jesus Christ, amen, amen. We have seen the mystery of the seven seals of Revelation chapter 5. May God continue to bless you all. May God keep you, and we will see each other again in the next service where we will be having fellowship around the subject, the mystery of the door open in heaven that appears in Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. I will see you again in the next service. Let's see here. What time will the next service be? The next service is at 3 in the afternoon, and I will be with you to testify to you about the mystery of the door open in heaven that appears in Revelation chapter 4. May God bless you. May God keep you and continue spending a day filled with the blessings of Jesus Christ, our Savior. I will leave Reverend Miguel Bermuda's bearing with us to continue and conclude our participation on this occasion. I will leave Reverend Miguel Bermuda's being with us around here. He should be coming around here now. He is already close. Ya tenemos a Miguel por aquí. Que Dios le continúe bendiciendo a todos. Y con nosotros, Miguel Bermúdez David Guerrero.